So, yeah, nice to, to, to meet all, all, all the people at this workshop. So my name is Gleb Pogudin. Uh, I work at Ecole Polytechnique uh, in, in, in Paris. I work in, in, in a symbolic computation group. So our area of research is that we uh, work with all things which are basically expressions. And me, myself, particularly, I work with differential equations and uh, things alike. Uh, but uh, I typically treat them not from purely numeric perspective, but also from perspective of symbolic computation. That's uh, uh, that means uh, looking at the ways to rewrite them, restructure them, or find some sort of symmetries. Uh, and so this is uh, particularly why I work on this structural identifiability problem. And I will tell you now about this problem uh, and about the package I maintain uh, for for solving this problem. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't see the chat when I speak. So if you, but feel free to interrupt me. Just uh, do it by by sound. Okay. Okay. So here we go. So what I'll talk about first, of course, I will explain what what do I mean by structural identifiability. Uh, then I will talk about the software. I sh will show the software, uh, and then I will talk a little bit about kind of the frontiers, things which we. Uh, cannot do it right now, or we can, but a little bit uh, hacky, and how uh, things I how things will evolve in the future. Uh, so, what is structural instability? I will start with two toy examples. So, first very, very toy example is the following scalar OD model. So, we have a single unknown function x of t, and there are two scalar parameters. And they appear in the function in a quite peculiar way. They appear as a plus b, which is, of course, not really what you would do normally. But let's assume for the sake of the example that this is how it is. Uh, and now we are in a situation when we are given certain time series for x of t. And we would like to find values of a and b. Uh, well, but because they are, appear in such a peculiar way, only as a sum, then, of course, you would naturally expect that maybe you can get the sum of A plus B from the time series, but not A and B uh, themselves. Uh, in particular, you can, you can see that if you have certain values A0 and B0, which work, which fit well into your time series, that values A minus C and B plus C will work absolutely as well. So they will give you exactly the same fit. It will give you actually exactly the same trajectory for X. Uh, and thus, uh, it's not possible to find out values of A and B separately, uh, independently of how well or how frequently you measure X of T. So this is kind of first, first, first very simple example. You can make it a little bit more involved uh, by adding term A plus B. OK, now you still want to find parameters A and B, but now they, they, well, they appear in a bit more diverse fashion. So you have A plus B and you have A times B. So it's not just the sum which you uh, can hope to infer. And well, so still we assume to be given time series for x of t, and we would like to infer these values. But it's still not possible. Uh, now the reason is slightly subtler. Uh, the reason now is that if you have values a0 and b0, then values b0 and a0 will give you ex exactly the same result again. So importantly, this is really a structural property, property, property of the model, that uh, if you swap a and b, the model doesn't change. So therefore, it's, uh, if, if you measure x of t better or in more data points, it will not help you. Okay, So you should do something with your model, or you should just lower your expectation and don't hope to get uh, a and b uh, separately. So these are kind of two simple simple examples of this non-identifiability. So uh, I, will, I will say that these parameters a and b, they are not identifiable. Uh, and this is, of course, I mean, artificial examples made for sake of of example, uh, can these things occur a bit more naturally? Let me show you one more example, which will still be quite simple, but uh, not as, as artificial as, as these two guys. So this is a system of, of two ODEs. This is a linear ODE system. Uh, you can think of this as a model with two compartments, first and second, and there is outflow from the second compartment, which goes to the first, and then there is outflow from the first compartment, which goes to outer space. Okay? so. For this model, there is no clear symmetry. I mean, first and second compartment, where they are have different uh, role. Uh, and now we assume that we do have time series for x1. So I took some parameter values and some initial conditions. I generated this data. So this data, I, I have a code for it. So this is some actual data. And well, 
I would like to fit A and B to this data. So I would like to find A, B, and also initial condition for X2, which would uh, uh, be as close to this data as possible. So now to do this, let me try to take different A's and B's and plot uh, the, the error. So this is the heat map. So I, uh, for each value A and B in these intervals, I find the optimal initial condition for X2. I compute the L squared error and I plot heat plot the log. Okay, so this is this is the uh, kind of region in the parameter space, and I, I plot the error and logarithm of the error, and you see there is a small dark point in in in, in blue circle. So this dark point uh, it has error you know, ten to minus twenty two, so it, it has error more or less zero, and this corresponds to values b zero point two and a zero point seven, and these are exactly the values I used to generate the data. So from this picture, it's tempting to say, aha, so we found them. These are 0 0.2 and 0 0.7. These are the values. We can go home. But now, if we zoom out the picture a bit, we have a problem. Uh, we have two values. Both of them have, give very nice fit. So the error is 10 to minus 20. And in fact, I can tell that they, they both yield exactly the same result. So this is a typical uh, situation when you uh, see this um, non-identifiability. In more metaphoric terms, you kind of have you know several people who look like Agent Cooper, uh, and but you don't know who is the real Cooper. And in some sense, you are in much bigger trouble when you are at the first plot because the first plot you think that you know what is the real parameter values and you may go ahead and use them, uh, while if you know that your model is not, uh, if, the that if you know that parameters are not identifiable, so in this case, if you know that actually you have uh, parameter values 0 0.2, 0 0.7, and 0 0.7, 0 0.2, which give you the same fit, you can then try to understand uh, which of them will be more natural. For example, in some applications, people do know that A is larger than B, and this allows you to, to solve this ambiguity. So, but it's it's important to know about this problem. Otherwise, we can go ahead with the first plot and never know that we actually uh, used wrong parameter values. So this is the, the this is the basic setup. Uh, now let me say it a bit more formally. What is the general framework I work in? So I I consider ODE models. So I have state variables axes, which are governed by some rational function f where by rational, I mean polynomial divided by polynomial, so I allow uh, denominators. And the dynamics depends on some scalar parameters k on the state and also on external input. And I augment this, this dynamical model with certain outputs. So these are the uh, things I assume that I will have time series for. So in terms of my example from the, per from the previous slide, I will have single y, which will be equal to x1, because I had time series for x1. So, and in this picture, my states and parameters there, I don't assume them to be known, while I assume that I do have some, some data, time series data for y and u. Okay, so this, this is the setup, this is the, the, the input I would like to take. And the structural identifiability problem is that for parameter k, I said it's identifiable if I can determine this value from u and y. If you know, if if I the, the parameter values and initial conditions are generic enough, so if I don't uh, uh, hit some sort of singularity of the model. So this is a property I would like to check, and the important thing is that this property is independent on, of data. It's property of the model, so I can check it before any data collection. It's just a computation. I will not waste any uh, equipment or something. I will just waste some computational time. Uh, and of course, it's important to check because if I don't have identifiability, I cannot really trust uh, the results of parameter estimation, or at least I should examine the, the different possibilities of parameter estimation and use some extra domain knowledge to find which is the right one. So uh, here, by this can be determined, there are basically two types of structural identifiability people uh, may consider. People may talk about global and local identifiability. If I talk about global identifiability, I want the parameters to be uh, determined uniquely. If I talk about local, I want them to be unique in a certain neighborhood, 
so I want to be I'm determined up to finitely many values. So for example, the example in the previous slide when I had two minima was locally identifiable, but not globally. And here's a table with some examples. So this is if you take just exponential growth, then parameter A, unless X is a constant zero function, parameter A will be identifiable if you, your data is reasonable, reasonably good enough, uh, both in global and local sense. So this model, which we have seen on the first slide, where I can swap A and B, I don't have global identifiability because I can swap A and B, but I still have local identifiability because basically uh, swap is the only symmetry which, which exists here. And finally, the, the first artificial example when I had A plus B, well, it's neither global nor local identifiable because, well, I can check, I can change to any pair which has the same sum. So I have infinitely many options. So these are things we would like to, 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 uh, to, to verify. So we would like, given the model for parameters, we would like to, to say if they are global identifiable, local identifiable, or not identifiable at all. So this is the, the setup which we would like uh, to solve. And now let's go to software which does the, solve this problem. So far so good? Okay, as I said, please feel free to, 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 to interrupt me. So for the software. Yeah, yeah, yeah very, very good. I just had, very good. I just had to unmute my uh, mic. Ah, okay, sure. Okay, good, good. So uh, structural infibility is a Julia package. I mean, it's a, a registered, so you can install it as any other Julia package. PKG add structural instability, and you, you have it. So it started in 2020 with my colleagues, uh, Ruben Dong, Christian Goodbreak, and Heather Harrington. And since then, uh, many other people whom I will thank at the end uh, were involved in the development, and the uh, thing has evolved quite a bit, and I hope will evolve more in the future. So what are the features? So first of all, it can check local instability for any, not just for single parameters, but also for, for initial conditions, for states and also for any function of parameters and states. And this uses a classical algorithm by Sudoglavich. It's quite efficient. I will talk about uh, efficiency in a moment. Uh, for global infibility, global infibility is normally a much harder problem. So if you want uniquely determined, if you can uniquely determine it or not, uh, it can uh, assess global infibility of any function in parameters only. Not States are not allowed right now, but I will talk a, uh, a bit a bit more in uh, closer to the end of the presentation. Uh, and finally, from the user point of, uh, of view, it's compatible with modeling toolkit. And I will show this in a demo that yeah, you can use modeling toolkit to define your model and then just feed in it into structural instability and you'll get the result. So now, uh, well, how efficient is this? Uh, so because if you heard some talks or people speaking about uh, identifiability, Global instability is a notoriously hard problem from computational perspective. It's very uh, computation heavy. So what we can say now, so for local instability, I mean, if your dimension, if the number of states is less than 100, that should be all right. I, I, I normally, I mean, it kind of depends on the nonlinearities you have on the right hand side, but yeah, tens of dimensions is, is not a big problem for local instability. Now for global, it's much harder, uh, very roughly, uh, if your number of states doesn't exceed four times the number of outputs, so then it should work. Uh, but this doesn't, it's, it doesn't really de determine by these dimensions. It's more determined by the type of nonlinearity, so it's much more subtle. But as you know, basic rule of thumb, I would give you this formula. I mean, sometimes if this ratio is larger, it still works very fast. Sometimes if this ratio is around four, it runs forever because the nonlinearities are particularly nasty. So it's, uh, I cannot give you guarantees, but this is this is a rule of thumb. So now let me just show you how it works. And yeah, so this is a, a notebook. So you you load structural instability, you can load modeling toolkit. So now let's take classical Pareto frame model. So we introduce, if I, I, I will use definition using modeling toolkit. We have also on all macros, but let's let's do this. Uh, so we introduce parameters, we introduce variables. There will be x1 and x2, which will be states, and there will be also y1, which will be our output. And this is the model. This is a further prey model or lot cavalterra model, dep depends on how you call it. So this is a nonlinear quadratic model of dimension two, and here it is. And now, so we we create an ODE system from that from model toolkit, and we call assess identifiability function from the package. Uh, and we give it 
as an input to their model, and also there's measured quantities. So what are the outputs? So I'm saying that I will have time series for x1, but not for x2. And we'll do some computation, print some log, but at the end of the day, it will tell you this. So it will tell you that parameters A, B, or A, D, and C are globally identifiable, and B is not identifiable. So this B here is not identifiable, and yeah, so this follows because it, you, you, you can do scaling on a variable x2 and you can actually make it any number. So that's, this is a correct result. And from the point of view of parameter estimation, it tells you that A, C, and D, you can hope to infer from time series data for x1, but not B. Uh, and as I said, so for global infability, you can get only parameters, but for local infability, you can also get the states. So you can ask Funks to check and give here states x1 and x2. And yeah, and it will tell you that yeah, x1 of course is identifiable because it's given to you. X2 is also not identifiable because basically there is a scaling which involves B and X2. Okay, so for local you can also get this. Now, second example is actually the example I had uh, with linear systems. So there was flow from X2 to X1 and also flow from X1 to like outer space. Uh, I, the point I want to make here is that also you can use other packages in the in the SIML uh, ecosystem. So you can use Catalyst, for example, so you can define your equations by uh, chemical reaction network like this. So that you have flow from X2 to X1 with rate B and flow from X1 to nowhere with rate A. It will give you a reaction network. Then you convert it to ODE system. And then you can do the same. So you, you, you take X1, you say that, well, my observed variable is this X1, you assess it in fiability, and you get that parameters A and B are lock identifiable, which is true because this is, what is, this is what, I, what I said, that you can, you can swap them in this model as well. And then you can also check that check. Will it work? Okay, it works. Um, yeah. So it will tell you that okay, oh sorry, A plus A, A plus B were from 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 the other one. Parameters D E. Okay, so this is yeah. Sorry, improvising on on the demo is not always the best thing. <laughs> Parameters. So I I can take sum of a and b. And that will be global identifiable. And the same will be the product. So this is how it works. You define your model with modern toolkit with reaction network, or you can actually write differential equations with our, our own macros. You uh, use assess identifiability or assess local identifiability, and you'll get the result. Okay, so this is this is what we can do right now. Uh, now, what we cannot do and what we would like to do, and what we can do partially. So one thing is that, as I said, you can assess local identifiability of states but not global instability of states. This is current imitation. Current workaround, which I typically you know, uh, use when I try to analyze someone, someone's model and I, which I typically advise to users for the time being, is that there is another package uh, in Julia called CyanGL, which can assess global instability of states. And there is also a web application uh, which, which can, can do that. Uh, the Problem is that they frequently cannot tackle models of the size which can be tackled by um, structural instability.gl, but you can combine them in the sense that uh, what you can do is you can first assess identifiability of parameters, and then if you know the parameters are identifiable, you can add them as kind of dummy outputs to the model and run one of these two guys. And in that case, computations are much faster and you will also get the result for states. So right now, in principle, you can get with you know tools available in Julia and online, you can get uh, normally identifiability results for all the states as well. But we're working on on on, on having this feature in, in structural identifiability uh, just right here, out of the box. And I hope that soon this workaround will be not longer really necessary. 
Uh, another thing is that uh, so this is the this is the example we have, uh, and we have seen that A and A and B are not identifiable, and also in the demo uh, the computation showed that A plus B is identifiable. So it's natural to ask, well, then which combinations, which functions of A and B are identifiable? And right now, this can be done in principles. So this is a Julia code which does this. So you first find input-output equation, whatever that means, and you use this extract identifiable functions, and you get these two things. And once you get these two things, it tells you that the, the identifiable functions are exactly A plus B, A times B, and whatever can be expressed from them. Okay? So in particular, yeah, so you know A and B as a pair, but you don't know the ordering. Uh, and this works, you can do this, and it's nice that such code, such code will always find the all identifiable functions. Uh, why do I put this into limitation section? Well, because right for this simple model, it gives in these functions in a nice form, but in general, they will be in non-simplified form, and for large models, you will get a couple of screens of some expressions, which are identifiable, but they're not super useful in the way they, uh, they are presented. Uh, I, with the colleagues, we do have some simplification code which, which is written in Maple. So right now, the way we work if we want to get identifiable functions is that we copy this output of this exact identifiable functions row function and go to Maple, which is annoying. And we are right now working again on having this right in structural identifiability, and we already have a simple prototype which does that. But yeah, so I, I hope over the summer we will have this just working out of the box. Uh, another question which I often get is that, well, I mean, uh, by uh, by description, the models should be defined in rational functions, so I cannot have exponentials or signs there. Uh, well, in principle, this is true. This is a limitation. Uh, what you can do, however, you can add new variables. So you can uh, say that you, your e to the x is a new variable u. Uh, u is not good than z, and then derive an equation for z. And by these operations, you can always make your system polynomial. I will show example in a second. But it's not really always uh, straightforward. So for this particular example, so let, I will be, um, to be on time, let me uh, be a bit fast here. So uh, the story is that if you introduce new variable e to the xt, then in some sense you go from uh, model with two dimensions because the model now is uh, original model is defined by a and x of zero, so they define a trajectory. Here you kind of have three dimensional model now because it is defined by a, x of zero, and z of zero. And in this new model, a will not be identifiable, why it actually is identifiable in the original model. So, what you can do is that you can uh, try to introduce variables. So it's a don't increase the dimension. So here, if you introduce variable a times the exponential, then you will get new state, but a will disappear. And then if you, you run the code on this, you get that uh, x of 0 and w of 0 are identifiable. And then a, which can be expressed for them, is also identifiable. So this is the way this can be done. And well, I mean, in, in the papers, we have several examples of this. You often can do such a nice uh, transformation. Actually, from models which arise in practice, I was always it was always possible to do this. Although, of course, I don't have you know a proof that it's always possible. So a couple more features which we don't also have and uh, would be nice to have is differential algebraic equations, PDs, SDs, and so on. So this is. Well, we know something about this, but not it's not in the code yet. Another thing we don't do yet is uh, that we cannot identif uh, assess identifiability given that some initial conditions are actually known. So uh, if you assume that your input is time series and also some initial conditions. And our code right now cannot produce a better model. So it can uh, detect some identifiability defects in the model, but uh, reparameterization is, uh, is right now on the user. Uh, but uh, the overall development of this package so far is example driven. So if you have some model for which you would like to solve one of these problems, feel free to contact me. I will try to work it out and maybe this will end up as a new feature. So to conclude, one thing I would like to mention is that my software is not the only well, software I present is not the only software of this kind. There is a bunch of softwares uh, which can be used to assess the feasibility of local, global, it, it depends. And there is a nice survey of uh, Javier Barreiro and Alejandro Villaverde, a recent survey which compares them in detail so you can 
uh, choose the one you would like. But uh, out of this, only Cyan, GL is in Julia. Of course, I would like to thank all the people who contributed to the package with the code on GitHub. Many thanks. Uh, I wouldn't do this job uh, alone, never. And thanks everyone for your attention.